This is the Canadian Arctic, and these islands are in the Queen Maud Gulf. Some are unnamed, many are uncharted. The islands lie 300 kilometers due north of the Arctic Circle. Some are scars of stone and rubble. Others are long reaches of cobble and sand. All are cold in midsummer and icebound come winter. They are barren, desolate, and for the most part scoured of life. Yet for all their apparent emptiness, these islands may hold a clue to solving a mystery which has baffled historians for 150 years. In the spring of 1845, the British Admiralty authorized Sir John Franklin to set sail from Gravesend, England, on what the world then called the Great Quest, the search for the Northwest Passage. With a crew of 139 men on two well-provisioned Royal Navy ships, the Erebus and the Terror, the Franklin expedition sailed north past Greenland, through Davis Strait and Baffin Bay, and into the pack ice of the waters in the high Arctic. Sir John Franklin, the great explorer, was a man obsessed with the chance of discovering the Northwest Passage, a man who followed a dream through the Arctic ice and into the killing silence of this frozen world. Franklin and his crew were never heard from again. Cambridge Bay is a small Inuit town at the 69th parallel. Here, John investigated an oral tradition of the Inuit, which told of the whereabouts of Franklin's ships. According to the storytelling, the ancestors of these Inuit had encountered white men near an island which they had called Yumi Artilik, the place where there is a Yumiark. A Yumiark is what the Inuit had called a white man's ship. According to oral history, the ship was frozen in the ice. The crew had abandoned it and were seen hauling the ship's longboats over this frozen land. The Inuit said that to reach the ship, they had to walk about three miles on ice in order to salvage wood and iron from it. The ship sank the following spring. For several years after, the Inuit saw its masts poking from the water. They said the wreck was near an island, which was five miles due west of a place they had called the Two Fingers. John narrowed their search to two points of land. One is Kirkwall Island, the other is O'Reilly Island. This is where they will find the lost ships of Sir John Franklin. Here, the team boarded the Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker, Sir Wilfrid Laurier. The Laurier will transport the team to the search sites. It will be their home for the next 11 days. Welcome aboard, Laurier. This is a high-tech search. The team has several sling loads of equipment to stow on board. Side scan sonars, magnetometers, a complete satellite global positioning base station, as well as half a dozen computers for processing the data. With the team and the gear on board, the Laurier weighs anchor. Keep coming to 131. Captain Webb sets a course for the first of the search sites, Kirkwall Island. Expectations of finding a lost ship run high. The ancient oral tradition points the way to the lost ships. This high-tech scientific search will find them. The Laurier steams east from Cambridge Bay, heading for Kirkwall Island. Left five degrees rudder. Left five degrees rudder, I see. Not far from Kirkwall, the Laurier runs a line of ice. Where to now, sir? A bad sign. Left five degrees rudder, steady to course 205. The 
team had planned for an ice-free window of 10 days to conduct the search. This ice line suggests an early winter. One storm could close the search window for another year. Finally, the Laurier reaches Kirkwall Island. Very well. The Laurier dropped anchor just west of the island, their first search site. Most of the crew on board the Laurier loved the Arctic, the cold, the ice-bound sea, winters without daylight, summers without night. It seems as though time unravels in the far north, as though the past and the present share the same moment. For more than a dozen years after Franklin had banished into this frozen land in 1848, the world had asked, where is Franklin? Although 50 expeditions went in search of Franklin, all that the world heard from that frozen land about the Erebus and the Terror was a single word, lost. The team will use the helicopter for transporting equipment to the islands and for aerial searches. I think one more trip, uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, it looks like I'll probably have about another 10 minutes, maybe two trips uh, out of this one. Uh, Roger, just keep us posted, thanks. Meanwhile, the launches, the wind and the urn, are lowered. A high wind has picked up and is knocking the chop on the water. That will make running sonar lines a little rough. The team flies to the east side of Kirkwall Island to conduct a ground search of the island and to install the receivers for the satellite global positioning system, GPS. GPS is a satellite-based radio navigation system by which users can calculate a particular location anywhere on Earth. 24 satellites in six circular orbits transmit radio signals of precise positioning and timing information back to receivers on Earth. By linking GPS with the sonar readings in the two launches, the team will generate precise hydrographic information to fill in a lot of the white space on the navigational charts of the high Arctic. And when they hit a possible target on the bottom, the GPS link will allow the team to plot the target's precise location to dive and investigate. The ground search begins. Often when a ship goes down, the fragile remains on its decks break loose and wash ashore. With the GPS in operation, the launches run the sonar lines from opposite ends of the search area and work their way to the middle. In 1992, the Canadian Air Force conducted a magnetometer survey of the area around Kirkwall Island. They recorded 27 magnetic hits. Each of Franklin's ships had copper sheathing on the bow, and each was driven by a 15-ton steam engine. If there's a steam engine down there, the magnetometers on the wind and the urn will pick it up. After three days of searching the Kirkwall site, the launches have not had a single magnetometer hit. The ground search has been disappointing as well. There is no physical evidence that a sunken ship lies off Kirkwall Island. After a four-hour steam, the Laurier drops anchor off O'Reilly Island. John Rossborough, the sound technician, has just found an incredible piece of evidence. It is a piece of copper sheathing. Both of Franklin's ships, the Erebus and the Terror, had copper sheathing at the bow. The team has found evidence of a shipwreck. 
something they did not find at the Kirkwell site. Hope is running high. And now this, an oar from a small boat. Hope is running very high. Could it be? Yes, I'm puzzled by the, the plate of metal here. <clears throat> Over the next few days, the team concentrates their search on these islands. Two days left. The change in the weather has everyone worried. The long-range forecast is calling for an early winter storm. The chance of bad weather shutting down the search is frustrating, especially with being so close. Everyone feels it. Each day's discovery seems to get them even closer. The ore, the copper sheathing, the copper disc, a piece of wood with square nails. Each artifact must be properly recorded and photographed. And now this, the transom to a ship's lifeboat. The team has found several pieces to this same boat on seven different islands. The scatter of wreckage suggests a pattern to the direction of the currents. Debris from Franklin's ship could have washed up on these islands in the same way. Now they find a ribbed piece of wood. There's a sunken ship out there. Everyone is certain of it. With all this evidence, now is the time to continue the search underwater. The team will dive north of O'Reilly Island. This is also near where Steve Blasco picked up a strong reading on the magnetometer. The launches cannot run sonar and magnetometer lines through the ice, so Dave and Chris must dive to have a look. The ice provides good camouflage for a polar bear. Set your clocks, 20 minutes. The air temperature off O'Reilly Island is about 6 degrees Celsius. The water temperature is minus 2. There is no slow way to get into water this cold. You just do it. The ice is translucent enough for sun to fuel photosynthesis for plants and algae. There is even a crystalline sound to the ice. These are amphipods, shrimp-like crustaceans which live in these deep canals in the ice and feed on the algae.
their activity has crisp baffled. Most amphipods would be dormant in these freezing waters, yet these are as active as shrimp in the Caribbean. That scour mark is from the moving ice scraping along the bottom. This dangerous pack ice is in constant motion. An opening could close within seconds. There is also the danger of huge ice chunks breaking off and trapping a diver below. The magnetometer hit was just on the edge of the pack ice. Nothing. 16 minutes to sweep this quadrant at the magnetometer hit, and there is nothing. Getting cold? Good having your thick underwear, huh? Oh, man, spectacular! On a nearby island, Robert Grenier has discovered what looks like a tree trunk. But a tree trunk on a beach this far north of the tree line is most unlikely. It's not a tree trunk. This was hand-hewn, that's for certain. The butt has been tapered, as if to fit into a mast step. Is it a mast from a ship? Is this a mast from one of Franklin's ships? The collection of 34 artifacts the team discovered at the O'Reilly site is remarkable. Dating them will take laboratory analysis and a lot of research. But there seems to be little doubt in anyone's mind that some of these artifacts are from Franklin's lost ship. This piece of copper sheathing coated with tar must have come from a Royal Navy ship. For hundreds of years, sailors sealed their wooden ships with thick tar, then covered the wood with copper. Franklin's crew would have done the same. Robert also believes this copper disc is off a Royal Navy ship. He is very pleased. So is everyone else. The final piece of convincing evidence came within weeks after returning from the Arctic. John joined Robert Grenier at the Archaeological Research Section of Canada's National Historic Parks and Sites. Marine archaeologists confirmed what the search team suspected. This is, that kind of thing is, is very typical of uh, copper sheathing that you would find on a hull, so yeah. there's no question that it's off a boat, not at all. The copper sheathing and bolt, however, yeah, only no, confirm that the sunken ship is from the mid-19th century. It is the copper disc which connects the artifacts to Franklin's lost ship. The copper disc matches the bottom of a Royal Navy teapot from the mid-19th century. The only Royal Navy ship to have sunk in the Queen Maud Gulf was the Terror, the lost ship of Sir John Franklin. The sunken ship off O'Reilly Island is that of Sir John Franklin. And next summer, John and the search team will return to search for the lost ship.